So it's a 38 story building that is 80 feet in the air, sitting on columns. That's really cool. So the question is, how do you set 20 precast tapered concrete columns in a skyscraper in downtown Seattle, spanning vaults on a steep grade, surrounded by trees, trolley wires, overhead power lines, with nighttime noise restrictions, daytime road closure restrictions, short work permit windows, and all in a tight space. Our customer kind of had intended to use two cranes to lift these columns, one crane to as the head crane to lift and set them, one crane as the tail crane. The delivery was intended to be done with over-the-road trucks. They were going to deliver to site and directly under the crane hook. So after we did the initial job walk, it became pretty apparent that two cranes were not going to fit at this site and the over-the-road trucks couldn't get anywhere near where they needed to be for positioning under the crane hooks. The location was tight, really tight. First and second both run north and south, and then it's between University and Seneca. From second to first are steep hills. There's vaults all over the place. And then you get down to First Avenue. First Avenue wasn't an underground uh, utilities that we had to work around. It was the above ground utilities, which was the trolley wires. Um, in order for us to work there, we had to have all the trolley wires, north and south, removed to fit all of our equipment in. So what we came up with was bringing in a tri-lifter as a tailing device. Uh, it would be stationary, but it would support the tail of this load while we uprighted it, connected the secondary rigging for the primary crane to set these in place. For the over-the-road trucking, what we decided to do was bring in a second tri-lifter to work in tandem with the first and do a transload operation up at the street level to transload onto an SPMT in order to have a little bit more mobile access and, and be able to position the loads under the crane hook and in front of the tri-lifter inside of the building itself. At this point, we thought we had a pretty workable plan. Uh, the tri-lifter solved a lot of the site space issues. The SPMT solved the access issue, getting the loads uh, inside of the building and within crane range. Permit constraints on the 2U project are as complex as the project itself. Within a one square block radius, we pulled 39 various permits. Noise variances, road closures, road restrictions, trolley wire removal. As project planning continued, we received an update to the engineered weights of the columns, and we were able to accommodate the first update with just adding counterweight to the crane. The positions and everything worked out. A majority of our work for this project took place on 2nd Avenue. 2nd Avenue is a main fair through the city. You have Benner Royal Hall, you have the Art Museum, so it was very challenging to to give them space for traffic to get through. We, we did our best to always leave at least one lane open for them. And then the weight increased a second time. This required that we reposition the main crane to reduce the radius a little bit. Uh, we were able to accomplish this without moving the tri-lifter. Uh, we had to get a little bit more creative with the SPMT and how we were gonna position that to accommodate the two positions for the crane and the tri-lifter. But we had a pretty good plan. We were confident it was gonna work. Traffic restrictions on 2nd Avenue consisted of our crew starting at 1 o'clock in the morning and working till 5 o'clock, in which we had to be off of the road to allow standard traffic to travel. There, there's condos all throughout that area by the Pike Place Market, and people want to sleep. We're trying to get all of our work done so we can get off the road, but then we've got to be really quiet. We worked hand in hand with the city of Seattle to get noise variants to work basically day and night. That meant giving out flyers to all the residents, which was thousands of people. Uh, we did then receive a third weight increase to the engineering weight estimates. There wasn't a whole lot of room left for additional weight increases at this point. We could make it work as it is, but we kind of reached the limit with this version of a plan. During our process of permitting, uh, our weights changed, thus requiring us to re-permit for just about everything that we did. When the columns came in and we finally got the last number of what they weighed, we, we were worried. 
Generally, the city of Seattle likes between four to six weeks. Uh, we had about two weeks to try to pull this all together. Uh, these weights came in about 12% heavier than the highest estimated engineering weights we had received previous. And this 12% jump was just something we couldn't accommodate with the, with the current plan that we had. We brainstormed a couple of different ideas. One of the ideas we had was to use an SPMT with a tilt frame, but in order to uh, accommodate a frame like that, the SPMT would have to be so long that it wasn't able to accommodate the grade changes between the upper levels and the lower levels. It was going to bottom out. So we we're basically out of options. We didn't have any ideas and, you know, what do you do now? So what do you do? The first thing is to understand exactly the capacity problem that we were having. The issue in this case is the tri-lifter position is actually farther from the center point of the crane than the final set position of the columns. This is causing a problem because during the uprighting process, the main crane has to reach all the way out to the tri-lifter, which is now outside of capacity with these new weights. You can see from this site photo here that the site is a complicated situation. We've got outriggers spanning vaults on beams, we've got steep slopes, we were just not able to position the tri-lifter any closer to the main frame of the crane. So this is causing our crane to be out of capacity. So what we're looking at doing at this point is coming up with some single point rigging that one crane can use to pick and upright these columns straight off the transporter. And in that way, not having to reach all the way out to the locations where the tri-lifters are positioned. You can see that the rigging in this diagram is what the engineer that designed the columns had come up with. Basically, he's looking at using two pieces of rigging, shorter rigging for the head and long rigging for the tail. Uh, one thing that the iron workers brought up was we needed a variable link in the lower rigging in order that we could hit the 76 degrees and kind of vary around it a little bit. So we were looking at using a chain hoist to to make up the, the variable length rigging at this point. Um, the challenge with that piece of equipment is that there was over 100,000 pounds of tension in that lower rigging. So we're looking at using a 60 ton chain hoist, which added significantly to the overall weight of the rigging. So one of the challenges in designing single crane rigging was that we did not have any extra headroom in several of the lifts that we had to make. We couldn't get any longer with the main boom or the capacity dropped off and we're not able to add a boom suspension because there just wasn't room on the site. We had tower cranes, elevator cores, elevator lifts. There just wasn't room to swing with a boom suspension on. So we had to design single crane rigging that was not going to eat up any more headroom than the original design that the engineer came up with. So this is kind of our concept sketch with what we were trying to achieve. You can see we've got a rolling block at the top under the hook. And the rolling block kind of uh, solves two problems for us. One is that it allows the load lines to render through the rolling block as you run through the uprighting process. This keeps the head rigging to a minimum once the unit is uprighted. The other thing that it does is that your tertiary line, which is shown in this diagram, only needs to take up the difference in tension between the two load lines on either side of the rolling block. So that kind of cuts your, your size of your chain hoist requirement in half from about a 60 ton chain hoist if you're using uh, fixed head rigging to a 30 ton chain hoist, which cut down on the size and the, the weight that, that the hoist mechanism added to our rigging scenario. These are some renderings of the rigging design that we came up with. You can see that we've got two rolling blocks on either side of a sister hook. This allows us to use load lines that are about half the size and a lot more manageable, easier to handle. And it also creates space in between the load lines for the chain hoist to exist. You can see the chain hoist and the main rigging lines are kind of in the same plane from a side view. So once we had the final rigging calculations worked out and everything looked like it was gonna work. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss anything. So I, I did a mock-up in my garage of the columns using a just piece of rectangular tubing. And I weighed the whole assembly and then checked the tensions in the tertiary line as I went through the uprighting process. And 
to my satisfaction, everything came out within about 5% of theoretical. So I thought we were in pretty good shape. We went ahead and ordered the rigging and, and we're moving forward to this process. At this point, we got yet another weight increase. And this one put us out of capacity with our main crane. We could no longer reach all the way to the final set position. So we had to bring in a second crane and kind of share the load from the point where the main crane could reach to to the final set point for the columns. In order to do this, we had to add a passing triangle into the rigging scenario. This passing triangle, it enables the two cranes to share the load during the, during the lift, but it took the sister hook off of the rolling blocks. So we no longer had anything separating the two and creating that space. So we had to design what I called a swivel trunnion to pin onto the bottom of the passing triangle and simulate the sister hook, which allows the two rolling blocks to have the space necessary between them to accommodate the hoist in between the load lines. Once we had this all worked out, we felt it was necessary to do a test run just because none of this rigging had ever been connected to any of the other rigging before. A lot of this stuff was custom built and we just wanted to make sure that everything worked as intended. Uh, this also gave the iron workers and the riggers a chance to get a hold of this rigging and kind of give it a dry run when we weren't under work permit windows and road closure restraints. I really like this photo on the left hand side because this is the moment right when that dunnage cleared the column and everything came up flat that was the moment that I knew that everything was gonna work. We had verified all of the engineering, we have all of the planning in place, we're feeling good. We got this.